temple of God. In fact, we're going to talk about that now. We're going to talk about uh, the temple uh, in, to some degree. So, um, let's, uh, if you have your Bibles, please open them to chapter 11 of, of the book of Revelation. Chapter 11. Let's, uh, let's, let's read that. Then it was given me a staff, given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, rise and measure the temple of God. There it is. And the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court, which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,200 years. Uh, in 60 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone would desire to harm them in this manner, he must be killed. These have the power to shut up the sky in order that rain may not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and kill them, overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry, and they will send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. And after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were beholding them. And they heard a loud voice saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And then there was judgment. So um, let's ask God's blessing on his word here. Let's pray. Lord, we do ask again, uh, as we read these words and hear these words, cause us to keep them so we'll be blessed. But Lord, ultimately, we want to be blessed in order to reflect your honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, a um, number of years ago, uh, a very close friend uh, of mine bore a stillborn baby, and uh, we were talking long distance over the phone a few nights later. Of course, she was quite upset. She asked me, she was a believer, she asked me what should her response be to the loss of her child. Uh, before I could answer very much, she went on, to explain what she was thinking. She said, I know I'm a saved Christian and will be with God in eternity, but how am I supposed to react to this? How do I know that God won't take my two other children? How do I know he won't take my husband? And so I'm living in fear every day that just as one of my child has just been taking, other of my children may be, and, and, and maybe my husband... I, I know I live with God for eternity, but how can this drive out my fear? It's like we're ducks in a shooting uh, gallery. Why shouldn't we fear greatly? Why shouldn't such fear paralyze us? And if you read through the letters of Revelation, some of the churches were going through uh, some really bad persecution. In fact, we even have the statement in, uh, to Smyrna in chapter 2. And in verse uh, 9, he's, Jesus says to them, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews or not, but the synagogue of Satan, he says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. The devil's about to cast you into prison. Whoa. Um, so uh, why is it that we are not to fear? The people in uh, Asia Minor, certainly from persecution, uh, in some of the cities, they were fearing. And, uh, and I think that John writes chapter 11 here to answer this question of why we should not fear.
fear, despite what's happening to us, even what happened to my close friend. Verses 1 through 2 give us the beginning answer to why we should not fear. Let's read that again. And there was given, and by the way, it doesn't look like this is an answer to why you shouldn't fear. Okay? <laughs> but we'll see. And there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. And leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Now, uh, this passage is filled with uh, issues that Christians debate over. For example, is this a literal temple or not? Later, are the two witnesses two individuals with supernatural powers, or are they something else? It's, uh, are they Elijah and Moses? Are they Enoch and Moses? Or Enoch and Elijah? Paul and Peter, who were martyred? Who are they? So uh, this, this is a very hard passage. So let's try to look at it. Now, there are three ways to understand the temple in these verses. A currently popular view is that this refers to a literal temple in Jerusalem to be rebuilt right before Christ comes back again. And the measuring uh, refers to God physically protecting Jews, taking refuge from persecution in the inner parts of that temple. So it's a literal temple, physical temple, and I think many of us have heard uh, maybe some here who believe there will be a temple built in Jerusalem uh, either during the time of the Antichrist, probably, or in, at some point in the millennium. Um, now, a second way to view this, which is also literal, by the way. So the first view I've given you is, is, is part of the futurist literal view. The second view is the past literalist view. It's called preterist. And they believe this is a literal temple, and the same thing, Jews will find refuge in the temple. But it happened in 70, right, right before 70 A.D. It's all been, it's all been uh, uh, completed, okay? So that's what preterist means. It's actually a grammatical term that means past, a past tense. But it's the, the view that uh, uh, this is describing a past event, not future or present. A third view sees the temple altar and worshipers as symbolic, but not symbolic only for Jewish Christians at the end of time, but symbolic for all believers living throughout time who will be protected spiritually by God. I believe, as we're going to see, I think that's what the measuring is, protection. Okay? So it's this, it's this view, which I think is in John's mind, that is the, the temple is symbolic for Christians throughout the church age. The temple stands for God's presence with us. And now I want to try to say why I believe that. I want to give a reason for the particular temple hope that's in me. So, uh, first of all, how, how do we try to figure these things out? Um, well, there's a wonderful uh, principle, and it's called, let Scripture interpret Scripture. If you do that, if you do that rigorously, It'll be amazing. And one way to do that is use the margins in your Bible because those margins will show parallels and allusions to the Old Testament. Uh, even like in Revelation, they're not only allusions to the Old Testament, they're allusions to Jesus and what he said and what he did. It's amazing. In fact, there's a whole book called uh, um, The Synoptic Tradition in the Apocalypse. Apocalypse is another word for Revelation. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. So... We have the phrase, look at that phrase there, and they've now put a microphone behind me because they say when I turn around they don't hear me, so I'm kind of... Um, notice, uh, oh, we don't want verse 3, we want verse 1. Notice here that um, it says, the temple of God, the temple of God. The phrase is... Ton uh, neon uh, to in Greek. The temple of God. That phrase occurs ten times. And so in the New Testament, so it'd be important to see what it means, right? That's what we should do. 
If you don't have a concordance, you need to get a concordance. You probably get one online. Uh, one of the best things to do is, is buy something called Accordance, A-C-C-O-R-D-A-N-C-E. It's the best concordance you can get. But there are a lot of concordances. So you'd want to search Temple of God. In this case, you can even do it in English. Okay? Sometimes uh, some of these phrases are best done in, in, in Greek, but you can do this in English. Ten times. And guess what? Not once is it a literal, physical, architectural temple. Not once. So for example, let me give you examples. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that the temple of God is holy? Verse 17, if you are the temple of God, or if, uh, if anyone destroys the temple of God, for the temple of God is holy. 2 Corinthians 6.16, that talks about uh, being the temple of God, for we are the temple of the living God. Temple of God. Uh, and then we have um, Revelation 3.12. As a part of a promise, at the end of the letter to Philadelphia, it says, Jesus says to the believers, I will make you a pillar in the temple of God. Oh, are they going to become petrified like Lot's wife and he's going to make them part of an architectural temple? Absurd. Um, so you can go through and read it. Now, there's one place where it could be a physical temple, and that is uh, Matthew 26, 61, where the false witnesses say that Jesus claimed he could tear down the temple of God. But if you remember, the full explanation of that is John 2, where he says, tear down the temple of God, and I will rebuild it in three days. So there's a double entendre there. Yes, there's a physical aspect there, uh, uh, but really, he's talking about himself as a temple. He's begun to be God's presence on earth. Remember uh, John 1.14, uh, uh, the word became flesh and templed among us, and we saw his glory, tabernacled among us. We saw his glory. God's broken out of the holy of holies in Jesus Christ. It's amazing. And he is now, he is now that temple. And so, so really, you can't keep a good temple man down. You tear his temple down, and he's just going to raise it up. Um, and so every use is a symbolic use. Not one is a literal, physical, architectural temple. So what should we do with chapter 11 and verse 1? Uh, that was given me a measure of God like a staff. Someone said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Sounds like a physical temple, but, and it's possible. That's possible. All things are possible, but not all things are probable. And the concordance study shows what's probable. I think we should let Scripture interpret Scripture. Even in the book of Revelation, we have um, two uses. Uh, well, we have, um, yeah, we have two uses of temple of God in addition to this one that are symbolic. So uh, I think we should take this symbolically. Christians are a part of the true temple of God now because they're a part of Christ who is that true temple. Who said, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. Um, and so he reestablished that temple in his resurrection. Um, furthermore, if you just study all the uses of the word temple, not temple of God, but just temple, in the book of Revelation, okay? So we're going to do another concordance study. If you study temple, naos in Greek, elsewhere it occurs 13 times, and without exception it refers to the heavenly temple. And so that's probably the case here as well. Now there's, there's one time where it's a little different, and it is in chapter 21 and in verse 22. It's in the new heavens and earth, and John says, and I, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. So what he's saying is, uh, I saw no architectural temple. There, there it is. It's a literal temple he's talking about. But he says, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. 
They're the consummate temple. And then uh, during the church age, we, we begin to be part of that temple. So um, the altar is very interesting here. Uh, notice it says, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar. What's going on there? Let's let scripture interpret scripture. Let's let John interpret himself. He talks about an altar. Where does he talk about it? Chapter 6 and in verse uh, 9, he broke the fifth seal. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So Christians are seen as having sacrificed themselves on, on an invisible altar, sacrificed themselves for Christ. Notice, verse 9 says, Souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. They'd been, they sacrificed themselves for Christ. So the altar here is uh, that, that refers to how they worship in the temple. The temple refers to God's presence in, in which they're in, that unique tabernacling presence that used to be secluded in the back room of the Holy of Holies, but now it's come out with Jesus, and as he was ascended, the Spirit has descended, and we're now a temple of the Holy Spirit. He has caused us to, be, to come into union with Christ. He's a temple, and when we come into union with him, we become a temple. I've just written a book. Actually, it, 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 it's going to be uh, the first publication. You can, you can buy it uh, on, on the 25th of April. It's called Union with the Resurrected Christ. And the idea, there are 19 different things that when we believe, we come into union with Christ. And one of those is, since he's a temple, and he became an escalated temple when he rose from the dead, we become part of that temple. And... We become priests, really, where we, we are those who sacrifice ourselves on, on, on the altar of the temple. That's how we worship in that temple. It's amazing. We're going to see this further. And furthermore, uh, we are priests in doing that. It's like Romans 12, verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Uh, which is pleasing to God, which is your acceptable service of worship. And so we are priests, but we don't offer animals. What do we do? We offer ourselves, following in the footsteps of Jesus, uh, as 1 Peter chapter 2 says. So, um, and, and indeed, chapter 1 and verse 6 starts out by saying, I have made you a kingdom and priest. And chapter 5 and verse 10 repeats it. And chapter 20 and verse uh, 6 repeats it. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, quote, You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So that, that's our worship in that temple. That's how John interprets it in chapter 6. So we're letting John interpret himself here. And then uh, talks about those we, we worship in, uh, in that temple. Part of the ways we do that is by offering ourselves at the altar. Even, even the city in chapter 11 and verse 2. Notice, leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it. It has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Already, Christians have been called the new Jerusalem. Remember what chapter 3 and verse 12 says to the overcomers, the church of uh, Philadelphia, verse 12, chapter 3, He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple. We read that. Temple of my God, he'll not go out from it anymore. And I'll write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven. So we're, we're identified. Uh, when you take a name on, you take on the character uh, and the presence of what that name represents in the Old Testament. So uh, they are identified with that city. It's no longer a city of buildings and streets and alleyways. It's the people of God. And um, so 
uh, that's the case then even with the city. So we should expect that the temple, the altar, and even the city are symbolic. Why should we expect that? Chapter 1 and verse 1 that we saw earlier in our first message. Remember? Uh, this is uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants what must take place quickly. And he's sent by his angel uh, to a servant, John, to communicate. To communicate by symbols, to signify. So we're to it, that, that's the programmatic inter interpretive verse of the whole book. That tells us what to expect. It's symbolism. Yeah, there'll be some literal things, but predominantly it's going to be symbolic. And so that's another reason we should take the temple and the altar symbolically. So the temple, the altar, the city generally symbolize who we are. We're Christians, part of the true spiritual temple. But why are we said to be part of a temple and worshiping in its, at its altar? Well, again, I think the temple, here's the main point, represents that special tabernacling presence of God with us as we are in that true spiritual temple. The altar symbolizes the call of the church to suffer for its witness. In the Old Testament, the altar was also in God's presence, and animals were sacrificed on it. Now we Christians are in God's presence, and because of that, we're going to see we're enabled to sacrifice ourselves. It's how we worship in the midst of God's temple. So the reason we're said to be part of a temple and worshiping at its altar is to stress God's presence resides continually and always with us. Remember Matthew 28 says, I'll be with you always. I don't have time, but that's also a temple text. Everything's a temple text. But uh, that, that, that is a text related to the temple. The measuring of the temple, the altar, and the worshipers means that God is spiritually protecting. This language here of, uh, of measuring um, has to do with giving security to protecting. Um, God is guaranteeing that his presence will be with us no matter what happens. He'll never forsake us. And in fact, the New Jerusalem, if you read about the New Jerusalem in chapter 21, verses 15 to 17, it's measured. Different parts of it are measured. Why is that? Because the New Jerusalem, which represents the people of God, is secure. Nothing can harm it, nothing can violate it, nothing can uh, corrupt it. It's secured by God. And so the same thing is true here. With the beginning of those who are part of the temple, uh, they, are, they are measured. So, in fact, this measuring comes from Ezekiel 40 to 48. So you may remember that's a prophecy about a big, huge temple that's to come. And the measuring there is used 50 times to say this temple's really going to be secure. And actually, in chapter 21, it's the fulfillment of that Ezekiel vision. So God's people will be eternally secured. And it begins spiritually now. In this life, we are secured spiritually by the Lord. But, big, big exception, verse 2. Uh, uh, leave out the court of the temple, which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Well, what's that about? Well, the outside court of the temple could symbolize the false church, as distinguished from the true church. So the false church is being excluded from God's saving presence and will suffer spiritual harm, perhaps uh, uh, judgment. It's a possible view, but I think the better view is that it represents this outside part of the church does represent the true church during the church age, but it represents the physical part of the church. The physical side of the true church is not measured. But the spiritual part is measured in this age. We're secured. And at the end of the age, that security 
will extend to our physical resurrection body. Now we're raised spiritually. That's resurrection, by the way. Actual resurrection has begun. We've begun to fulfill the resurrection prophecies of the Old Testament, like Daniel 12, too. It's, we've actually been raised. That's what regeneration is, spiritually. And at the end of the age, we will be raised physically. That'll be the consummation of that spiritual regeneration. But in this age, we are not physically raised. We are spiritually raised. God secures that as we are in his presence in the temple, the invisible temple. But we are uh, not, our, our, our physical bodies are, are not secured. So, um, suffering is described, I think, in the last part of this verse. Look, look, at, look at this. Uh, it says, they will tread upon, underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Remember, I don't think the holy city is a city with buildings and alleys. I think that's the people of God. We've already been identified with the holy city, haven't we? In chapter 3 and in chapter 21, the holy city is, is the people of God. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a structural city. So, um, so we, we're going to suffer, it says, for three and a half years, a sim symbolic time of tribulation. Um, now that this is talking, with some say, well, this is future. This, this uh, 42 months, which is three and a half years. But if you turn to chapter 12, 5 to 6, it shows that three and a half years actually are the church age. How would we know that? Let's, let's read chapter 12. And you'll remember that chapter 12 is about Jesus at the beginning. He's born in verse 2. And uh, in verse 3, a dragon appears. And in verse 4, the dragon tries to devour the child who was born, probably referring to Herod and the persecution of Herod. Uh, and then uh, she, she gives birth, and then it says he was caught up to God in his throne. So that, that's, a pre, that's the most abbreviated summary of Jesus and his ministry I've seen. He's born, and he was caught up to God and to his throne. And then, verse 6, if you have your Bibles, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, for she had a place prepared by God, so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days. So those who believe that uh, verses 6, many believe verses 6 and following is about the future tribulation, that the woman refers to literal Israel, and that she flees into the wilderness during the tribulation. And uh, so there's a time gap between verse 5, between the child being caught up, and verse 6, the woman fleeing. And the time gap is thousands of years. Um, so if one takes a futuristic view of this passage, you have to posit a big multi-thousand year time gap between verse 5 and verse 6. I just don't see it. What I see is right on the heels of verse 5, when Jesus is, is resurrected and ascended, right on the heels of that, what happens? The woman, representing true Israel, the church, flees into the wilderness. That is, uh, suffer, uh, suffers tribulation. And, but in the wilderness, she had a place prepared by God. Now, that phrase, a place, uh, is typically used of the temple. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, if you look at a concordance in the New Testament, the word is tapas in Greek. It often refers to the temple in the Old Testament, especially the Greek Old Testament refers to the temple for a number of reasons. Uh, I think this is referring that during the three and a half years, 1,260 days, the woman has a place prepared for her in the presence of God. And it's during the church age. It follows right. Her fleeing the wilderness follows right on the heels of Christ's ascension, not thousands of years later. To take this futuristically, you, you, you have to plug in a thousand, multi-thousand year gap. I don't think that it works. So, um, Revelation 11, 1 to 2, here's the main point. is saying 
that God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering. Okay? Verse 1, we're in the temple. And verse 2, we're outside in the courtyard. By the way, remember that courtyard is, is, is a place of sacrifice. And so we're, we're not intended to be secured because our whole mission is to sacrifice in various physical and material ways. So God's not going to secure us for that. Uh, he's not going to protect us from physical suffering because he's calling us to sacrifice ourselves in, in a multitudinous ways. So God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering. God does not promise. Here's a key thing. that There's no health and wealth gospel here. God does not promise to bless us materially or physically in this life if we're faithful to him. He promises to protect us spiritually and bring us safely to eternal rest in a final resurrection body. I do believe in the health and wealth gospel, but it's true at the end of the age. There's nothing healthier than a full resurrection body. And that's why, by the way, I think people who, who study for the ministry ought to really study hard before they begin the ministry like doctors. Because, you know, doctors uh, have to be on top of their information because they're handling, handling a body. And I think pastors ought to be trained also, uh, as well as doctors. Doctors had to do surgery on the original body, right? Even if they don't become surgeons, they become family practitioners, they still have to do work on cadavers. I think pastors ought to, in seminary, do work on the original body of the Greek and Hebrew text and, and know, it, know it well. And so... Um, God promises to bring us safely to eternal rest, rest with him in the new heavens and earth. So uh, actually we are, as pastors, as uh, if you teach a Bible study, you don't have to be a pastor of a church. Maybe it's a Bible study. Maybe you have a little flock. Maybe it's a Sunday school. You have a little flock. Uh, whatever it is. Maybe you're discipling some people. That's not just spiritual. You are also ministering to their ultimate physical health when they get their resurrection body. You're helping them persevere until they get their resurrection body. We can make people healthier than doctors by God's grace, helping them to persevere. This requires an eternal perspective. What we do here for God does not help us to live more comfortably in a physical way. When we're faithful in our witness, in fact, we're going to often suffer if we are faithful. Because we're going to come up against resistance, especially in this culture. Already I'm hearing of people outside abortion clinics, and, and they're across the street and they're praying silently, and they're arrested. Now, that's not typical, but I think it might just be a, a tip of an iceberg that's coming. How long will it be? I know that seminaries and probably churches too, how long will it be before... Uh, it comes about that the, the, that the state is going to say, uh, you must agree to transgenderism, to homosexuality, to lesbianism, uh, and if you preach against that, you're going to jail because you're preaching against civil rights. I think that's around the corner. I, 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 I think we better prepare ourselves. I don't know how long that'll be. When we're faithful in our witness, we sometimes suffer in various ways from those who reject our witness. Take Polycarp. He was a man who lived in the middle of the uh, second century, a member and probably even an elder of the church at Smyrna at the time John wrote this letter to Smyrna. That's amazing. He was a pupil of John. He died. Uh, he was a leader of a church. He was burned at the stake in the year 155. He had been asked to say Caesar is Lord, but he refused. Brought to the stadium, the Roman proconsul urged him, saying, Swear, I'll set you free. Reproach Christ. Polycarp answered, Eighty and six years have I served him. He never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? When the proconsul pressed him further, Polycarp answered, Since you urged me in vain that I should swear by the fortune of Caesar, and you pretend not to know who and what I am, hear me declare with boldness, I am a Christian. 
A little later, the Roman governor answers, I have wild beasts at hand. To these I will throw you unless you repent. Afterward, he said to Polycarp, I will cause you to be consumed by fire, seeing you despise the wild beasts, if you'll not change your mind. But Polycarp said, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour, and after a little is extinguished, but you're ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment of eternal punishment, reserved for the ungodly. Why do you delay? Bring forth what you will. And soon after, he was burned. Remember my wife talking about uh, someone who died either in the Columbine shootings, maybe another one, but it was a young girl, and the guy shooting said, are there any Christians in here? Who's a Christian? She said, I am. He killed her. Just like, just like Polycarp. Polycarp and that girl had an eternal perspective which motivated him to endure present momentary affliction. His eternal perspective inspired him not to become so depressed by his circumstances that he could not express his faith and hope in God. It's not wrong to be sad about death because it means separation from loved ones, but in the midst of such temporary sadness, we can have ultimate hope. To despair is to lose hope. Sadness, you can have sadness in the Lord. Jesus cried about Lazarus. But he knew there was a resurrection. And being faithful in our suffering is, uh, is in our witness, that, that, that's really how we witness, isn't it? But as we suffer and we remain faithful to Christ, that's a witness. The invisible powers of darkness, not just people. The invisible powers of darkness can bring suffering upon us and discourage us from being faithful to God and make us a bad witness. One of the things the Puritans... Uh, you know, there's really a revival in reading the Puritans because they're, they're so good. And, and, and one of the things they talk about repeatedly is dying well. Whether it's a natural death or, or, or persecution, whatever it may be. But, but being a witness, trusting the Lord um, in our death. Not just our life, but our death. The invisible powers can discourage us. That's what happened to Job, isn't it? Remember Satan uh, told God, hey, if you take, take away Job's possessions and his family, he'll curse you. And so God says, go do it. And so it happened. And Job uh, said, um, he doesn't despair. He says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. And... Then he gets his body. The devil says, oh, if you attack his body, he'll curse you. He won't, he won't believe in you. And so it happens, and he says, his wife says, curse God and die. And Job says, shall we indeed accept good from God and not evil? So he was a witness. But what was he really a witness to? Not just to the fact that he didn't have to be part of the health and wealth gospel, that God had to give him good things, good material blessings, and then he would believe. He was saying, no, I, God didn't have to give me that to believe. But ultimately, what was he doing? He was witnessing to the fact that this was an attack on God's character. That God uh, wanted to bribe. That the only way he can get good worshipers is bribe them. And Job was a witness. That God, his character was pure and innocent. He was not a briber. So verses 1 through 2 have emphasized that God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering. But why does God want us to be assured of his protecting presence in the midst of our physical suffering? Why does he want us to be assured? The answer is given in verses 3 to 7. Let's read those verses. I'll grant authority to my two witnesses, and they'll prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Verse 4. If anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouths and devours their enemies. If anyone would desire to harm them in this manner, he must be killed. These have the power to shut up the sky in order that rain may not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. 
And when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So what's, what's this, what are these verses saying? I think it's that God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering. Why? That's what verses 1 and 2 have said. God's presence with us protects us through suffering. Why? That we would witness, that we would be empowered to witness. That's why you get two witnesses in verse 3, immediately. So God's spiritually protecting presence encourages us to persevere through suffering in our witness. His abiding presence gives us boldness to endure and tell others why we continue to trust in God and not despair. He is our guide and our shepherd. In fact, our very faithful response to God in suffering is a witness in itself to the hopeless world, which loses hope when it suffers death and other severe things. Remember, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, don't grieve as the rest who have no hope. And, and the preceding verse says, that's the way we're a witness to the unbelieving world. That's a witness by not despairing over losing a job, over losing a loved one, whatever it may be. And this is our mediatorial priestly role. Remember, it's a priestly role as we offer ourselves in sacrifice. The suffering is a sacrifice to the Lord. We're in the temple, and we're priests in the temple. Sometimes one of God's purposes is for unbelievers to sense God's presence with us as the reason for our not despairing. And they may want that presence in their lives too. This is our priestly sacrifice in the holy place. I had a friend who uh, worked with his father. They, they, uh, this was back in Boston. And he, um, they made robes for Catholic priests and Anglicans and so on and so on. That's what his father's business was. And he worked, the son worked in the business. And I knew the son. And the father was an unbeliever. And the son uh, uh, went to church very faithfully. And the father finally got so irritated. He said, I want you to quit going to church. It really bugs me. I don't like it. And the son son said, no, I'm going to keep going to church. He said, okay, you're fired. So he lost his job. Well, after a while, after a few weeks, his father asked him back. But the son was willing to sacrifice his job because of his uh, relationship with the Lord. So God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering. Why? Why does his presence protect us through suffering? Why does he want us to sacrifice ourselves as a witness? As a witness. That's why verse 3 um, immediately starts with what? My two witnesses. It's not unrelated to verses 1 to 2. Verse 3 is following organically from verse Verses 3 and 4 are following organically from verses 1 through 2. In fact, look at verse 4. These are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, I'm going to stop for a moment. Um, But I do want to say that the fact that they're lampstands shows that the temple theme is continuing. Remember lampstands? Lampstands were in the... uh, second sacred space outside the Holy of Holies in what's called the Holy Place. But I'm going to stop. Because now uh, what we're getting into is are these two witnesses uh, literal individual prophets to come who have supernatural powers? Because you'll remember that uh, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone would desire to harm them in this manner, he must be killed by fire. These have the power to shut up the sky in order that rain may not fall during the days of their prophesying. They have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So are these, is this Elijah and Enoch or uh, is this Moses and Elijah or uh, who is it? Is it Peter and Paul? Are, are they individuals? Uh, I don't think so. Many people do. Uh, we may even have some here in the audience who do, or uh, you have friends who 
who believe that. I think that this is the church. Some would say, oh gosh, you're just spiritually reading into things. You know, well, actually what I'm doing, what am I doing here? I'm letting scripture interpret scripture. How so? Look at who the two witnesses are in verse 4. Lampstands. They are two lampstands. They were, uh, lampstands, remember, as I just said, were a part, they were in the holy place. So Christians are being identified as part of the temple. But why am I saying this is the church here? Anybody tell me? Why am I saying the lampstands are the church? Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Exactly. We've already had explicit identification in chapter 1 and verse 20. Remember, the, star, the seven stars are the seven angels and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So someone said, well, they're not identified as the churches here. Let's let Scripture interpret Scripture when there's a debate. You think, it's some, you think they're individuals? Well, the only other place where lampstands occurs is the corporate church. It's the church. Yeah, they're individuals, but it's a group. But some would say, well, there are only two, so these got to be individuals. Well, anybody have an idea why there are only two witnesses, two lampstands? Thank you. Only two faithful churches. This is the faithful remnant witnessing church. That's why there are two, and two is the number of witness in the Old Testament. That's why they're called witnesses here. It's beautiful. So I hope you can see what we're trying to do with these symbols is, is not just willy-nilly allegorize or read in wild spiritual ideas. We're, we're letting John interpret John. Or we're, we're letting the Old Testament interpret the New. And why are they lampstands? Well, because they're seen as a part of the temple and also they're to shine their light as witnesses. So I don't think these are two literal individuals. But symbolic of Christians generally. Proverbs 16, 15 says, In the light of a king's face is life. If this is true of earthly kings, how much more with we who are spiritual kings and priests? Because this phrase here, um, two olive trees and two lampstands, that actually comes out of Zechariah 4. I'm not going to go back there. But in Zechariah 4, the two olive trees uh, represents uh, uh, a kingly figure and a priestly figure. And that's part of the reason, I think, in chapter 1 and verse 6, the church is said to be a kingdom and priest in chapter 5 and verse 10 as well. And so in the light of a king's face is life. How much more with we who are spiritual kings and priests? Um, so in the light of God's presence... In us can be seen by the world and become life to the world when they suffer but don't lose hope. And that the two uh, witnesses of the worldwide church is also clear. Notice what verse 9 says about the witnesses. And this is another reason why I think that this is uh, the worldwide church and not two individuals. Notice verse 9. Ooh, it's a computer. hope it doesn't fall. And those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies, the witnesses, for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Now, is this talking about, uh, is John foreseeing that there'll be two people and, and that people will be able to see the death, the dead bodies of these two individual prophets on worldwide television? Is that the idea? Uh, I think it's worldwide because the church, this is the worldwide church represents the world, and that's why everybody will see them. You'll notice, and those who dwell on the earth, all over the earth, will rejoice over them and make merry, and they will send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. I actually saw a Christmas card with that quotation, talking about taking scripture out of context. So, um, verse 7, notice what verse 7 says. 
says that when they have finished, when the witnesses have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Now that language uh, of make war, you see at the end of the verse, make war with them and overcome them. This language right here, make war and overcome. That right there is an allusion to Daniel 7, verse 21. And it's just a prophecy saying that the state, at some point, the unbelieving, persecuting state, will make war on Israel. Well, who is Israel now? Who is the new Jerusalem? It's the people of God. And that's what's going on. But it's war against a group, not two individuals. That's the point. Daniel 7, 21, this is war against the people of God, Israel. And now, who is the church? And this is not against two individuals then. In fact, what it says here, you notice, verse 11, and after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were beholding them. That is the language from the Valley of Dry Bones. Remember that? Valley of Dry Bones. That the breath of God would enter into them, and they stood... Uh, and who's that about? Two individual prophets? No. That's about Israel in the future being regenerated, actually. So it's about a group. So the faithful church will provide evidence at the end of time for the judgment of the ungodly by testifying that the ungodly rejected their witness. Let me say that again. It's, a, it's, it's really a sober thing when you witness. I had two friends who who went to uh, Tunisia and spent about seven or eight years there as just tent-making missionaries. They saw one convert in seven years. And when they came back to America, he went back to Islam. But witnessing has two sides to it. Witnessing can lead to faith. But witnessing here, their witness provides evidence at the end of time for their judgment. By testifying the ungodly rejected their witness. How are we empower, empowered to witness in the midst of our suffering? Well, verses 3 to 4 tell us God's presence spurs us on to witness. Look, look again at verse um, 4. The end of verse 4. Look at verse 4. Where are the two lampstands? They stand before the Lord of the earth. That's what the priest did in the temple. He stood before the Lord in his presence. And now we are priests in the temple. We stand before the Lord in his presence. And that generates desire for us to witness. Now verses 5 through 6 say that our witness in the midst of suffering is that like Moses and Elijah's. Look at verses 5 and 6. So our witness. It's compared to Moses and Elijah. Look at verse 5. If anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth. Uh, and we'll look at that in a second. Verse 6. These have the power to shut up the sky in order that rain may not fall during the days of their prophesying. That's Elijah. That's what he did. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood. That's Moses. So their witness in some way is compared to Elijah and Moses. Um, the, this description about fire uh, proceeding from their mouth and consuming their enemies has come back. If anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth. That's Elijah. Second Kings, chapter 1, verse 10. When soldiers of the evil king of Israel tried to capture Elijah, fire came down from heaven and consumed them. So again, that, that, that's part of what Elijah did. Uh, so what is it? If this isn't a supernatural fire, what is it? If these aren't literal flamethrowers coming out of the individuals mouths what, what is it we have to use our concordance and we have to here's what we have to do 
So I hope, actually, part of what I'm doing today is saying, how do we study our Bibles? How do we interpret? Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Look at this phrase right here. Proceeds out of their mouth. If you study, you might not think that's significant, but it is. Proceeds out of the mouth. When that phrase is used elsewhere, what does it mean? Well, in chapter 1 and verse 16, a sword proceeds out of Christ's mouth. And the same thing in chapter uh, 2 and verse 12 and 16, chapter 19 and verse 15, quote, a sharp sword proceeds out of Christ's mouth. And there are a couple of other places where uh, it refers to uh, deceptive influence coming out of the mouth of demonic beings that's part of judgment. So all of it is about judgment. So when fire, when, when something proceeds out of the mouth of someone in the book of Revelation, it's judgment. And so here, they are judging. Their, wit their witness, their word is like fire, like Jeremiah's fire. God's word is like fire. Their word is like fire, and it is devouring their enemies. What does that mean? It's laying the basis for their judgment. Already that begins in the present. Because they're hardened, they're intractable, they're separated from God, they're in the beginning stage proleptically of hell itself. <coughs> so the fire proceeding from the witnesses' mouths, consuming believers, is our witness, pronounced by our mouth. It provides evidence at the last judgment against those who rejected our witness. That's how it devours them, ultimately, at the last judgment. The ungodly are already judged in the present when they are intractable, decisively reject our witness. Since rejection of God's word hardens people and keeps them in spiritual separation from God. Now verse 6 describes our prophetic authority in witnessing, as we saw, further example compared to uh, Elijah who... Uh, stopped, uh, stopped it from raining, and Moses who turned the waters into blood. And the reason they did that is because evil kings had rejected what? Their witness, their testimony. Now, we as Christians don't have the same miraculous power, but our witness has a similar power. It has the power to lay the, evidence, uh, the basis of judgment. In fact, notice what it says in verse... Um, Six, at the very end, look at the very end. Smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Now, these, these plagues are very interesting because if you do a word study on plague in the book of Revelation, one of the places it occurs is at the very end of the book, chapter 22 and verse 18 you might, you know, it's a very famous verse. Chapter 22, 18 says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And so uh, the plagues that these two witnesses uh, um, are, are able to uh, exercise and to smite the earth with are really against the, the, these unbelievers and their, their forms of judgment beginning in the, in the present, even in the present. Because, have you noticed in 22.18, I'm going to read it again, these plagues are not something just only for the future. They're also in the present. Notice, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Some of those plagues are not at the very end of time. Some are even in the present. And I think these witnesses are performing present plagues. That will lead to consummate judgment. Our lives are patterned after that of Moses and Elijah. Both of these prophets were rejected by unbelievers because of their witness, and they suffered as a result. But because God's presence was empowering them, they were unable to persevere and to continue to be a witness. Now, that doesn't mean they were perfect. Remember, 
Elijah got very depressed. I mean, we, we, we're not perfect believers in this life, obviously. He became very depressed. He even wanted to die. He says, oh, Lord, it's enough now. Oh, Lord, take my life. At least he did that instead of committing suicide. But he wanted God to do it for him. But above all, the pattern of the witnesses in verses 1 through 11 is meant as a replica of Christ's career. They're like Christ. Look at the pattern here. I'm going to say it now. One, Christ was a faithful witness to God. That's from chapter 1 and verse 5, as they were. Number two, this witness continued for about three years, three and a half years, roughly, as the witnesses. Three, it resulted in satanic opposition and suffering. Four, Christ's witness ended in violent death. Five, people rejoiced over his death at the cross. And then there was vindication through resurrection. Same thing in this passage. This is why chapter 14 and verse 4 says this. We follow the lamb wherever he goes. And as priests, we die little deaths every day. Elizabeth Elliot uh, uh, wrote this. So how do we sacrifice ourselves? We die a little deaths every day. It may be dying a little death for your mate, uh, doing something you really don't want to do, um, but it's best for your mate. It may be doing something for your boss, something you really don't want to do, but the boss is demanding it, and you suffer, and you persevere, and you do it as a sacrifice to the Lord. Obviously, there's some qualifications on these things, I mean, if your boss tells you to go commit suicide, you're not going to do that. Okay, so God's presence with us protects us spiritually through pain to empower our proclamation. Let me say it again. Verses 1 to 6 are saying God's presence with us protects us spiritually through pain to empower our proclamation. Do we get depressed over circumstances when they're bad? We may be going through hard times because our witness has been rejected. Unbelievers may react badly towards us because we remind them they have no hope. And that's what's going on here. And that reminder can torment their consciences. Look again at verse 8. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, mystically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. And those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their bodies for three and a half years. Days and not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry. They'll send gifts to one another. Because why? These two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. They're tormented by our witness. Wow. That's amazing. They don't like it. We're living in a culture where they're going to more and more and more dislike our witness. More and more and more dislike you being a Christian. More and more dislike you for not only putting up, perhaps, with their ungodly lifestyle, but they're not going to like you because you don't want to adopt their lifestyle and agree that it's true. They want that. Not just for you, not just to let well enough alone. No, they, they want this. The state will want things that will be against our witness. At other times we suffer, yet it seems to be for no apparent reason. It may not be overt persecution, as in Job's case. The devil brings these things upon us, and we're to be a witness in the midst of it. In fact, the, that the devil brings these things is apparent. Listen to chapter 2 again. In the letter to Smyrna, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you'll have tribulation ten days. Be faithful. So Luther said, the devil is on a chain. The Lord jerks him wherever he will. He was kind of, uh, he said things very bluntly, Luther did. And that was one of them. But the devil is under God's sovereign hand as he was in Job, as he here is in Smyrna. The devil bring, can bring these things 
to try to ruin our witness. Sexual immorality, whatever it may be. I, my wife and I knew someone, um, and very, very close friend. And when he died, it became evident that he had swindled. He was a financial planner. He had swindled elderly woman, women out of thousands, thousands of dollars and left his own wife penniless. Death is a tragedy uh, that touches all of us. Most of us have known people close to us who have died. And as we have said, many unbelievers weep with no hope. But our witness in the midst of that is to show hope. So how would you answer my sister-in-law's question that we began with, who had a stillborn baby? I tried the best I could over the phone. But I believe Revelation 11, 1 through 6, is a vital part of the answer. Physical part of our temples have not been measured or guaranteed by God to be protected. But God has guaranteed to protect us spiritually, enabling us to have that altar priestly ministry. We're called to suffer in various ways, whatever those ways may be. The state may not be persecuting you now. Others may not be per persecuting you. But, you know, we die little deaths every day. We sacrifice in various ways every day. It may be for a friend. Uh, your friend wants you to do something and you really don't want to do it, but it's not against the Bible. And uh, say, I'm going to perform a priestly ministry today. You know, it really does transform the way you look at things when you say, today I'm going to be a priest. What's a priest? One who mediates between God and humanity. Now, priests mediated to Israel, and so we can be priests to our believing brothers and sisters. The priests also mediate between God and the dark world. I teach in a seminary, so I'm around believers all the time, and I pray, Lord, bring me unbelievers. Cause them to cross my path. And, um, and of course, that happens in some way because my seminary students will go out and they'll witness to unbelievers. So I know I have that sort of a witness, but um, I often don't see unbelievers. And I pray that we cross my path. But God is guaranteed to protect us spiritually. He's guaranteed if we have come to know him and have entered his presence, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, he'll never take away his presence from us, though he may take away many of our physical comforts. How can this help my sister-in-law or you and me? Number one. Here's how. First, she and we should be motivated to live each day into eternity because God has promised in Matthew 28, he'll be with us always, even to the end of the age. So should we, we should be comforted with God's presence, through fellowshipping with him in his word and prayer. That's how really we encounter God's presence, typically in the word and prayer. as we are in the temple worshiping. That, that's part of temple worship. Secondly, furthermore, each day we live, we can get to know God better through his word and prayer. And as we do that, we find out how much God loves us. First John says, perfect love casts out fear. The more we're assured of God's love for us, the less we're going to fear. Are you assured of God's love for you? You really believe that God so loved the world? that he sent his son for you to die on the cross, to rise from the dead as the Lord God of heaven and earth. Thirdly, as we become increasingly, uh, as we increasingly enjoy God and know his loving purposes for us, we can trust him to be our guide through each day in order ultimately to get to the goal of enjoying eternity. We have a calling to become priests, offering ourselves as sacrifices. This should consume us and take away our fear. I remember when I first started uh, to preach. It was horrible. I said, oh my gosh, I've got to get up before these people, and they're going to look at me 
for maybe 35 or 40 minutes. Just me. I, I don't know if I can take that. I was very self-conscious. And then I found that as I began to prepare for my sermons and I got in to the passage that I was going to preach or teach, as I got into that passage, I began to apply it to myself. And I became consumed with what it meant and what it meant for me. And that drove me to preach and drove me to be more conscious of God and his word and honoring him than being self-conscious. That's anthropocentric. Selfish. So the more I was consumed with the word, the less I was self-conscious. And the more we're consumed with the word, in this case, that we are priests. Mediating. When you think about that, how can you mediate for your, your mate, your church friends, unbelievers? Well, at the end of time, Christ will vindicate our testimony and finally judge those who rejected it. We saw the resurrection of the witnesses and then this earthquake that's the beginning of judgment there in uh, verse 13. A great earthquake, a tenth of the city fell, 7,000 people were killed, uh, the rest terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. I don't think they're believers. I think they're like Nebuchadnezzar giving glory to God. That wasn't a real, he wasn't a genuine believer. Uh, this is the beginning of judgment here, right after the resurrection of the witnesses. So, um, and, and this is really the main point of verses 1 to 14, the vindication of the witnesses through their resurrection. That's how Christ was vindicated. The world had judged him to be in the wrong the resurrection overturned the false verdict of the world, and so it will be with us. So God's presence with us spiritually, here's the main idea, God's presence with us spiritually through suffering. He protects us spiritually through suffering to empower our witness. There's a book called The Persecutor. There's been debate about that book, whether it's an accurate book or not. I, I, I think there's much in it that is. But it's written by a man called Sergei Kortikov. It's an autobiography. He writes about his life when he was part of the KGB in the Soviet Union. He was the leader of a special squad whose main purpose was to persecute Christian churches. Inflicting terror and suffering upon Russian Christians was his assignment, and he did it well. Usually his squad attacked small house churches. He, his group would uh, over throw, overturn the chairs, beat people up, uh, sometimes almost to near death. One particular house church kept meeting repeatedly, even when their meetings were repeatedly broken up by the KGB squad, and their members were brutally, brutally beaten. Now, Kortikov noticed in that church a young, beautiful girl, about 20, and he noticed she kept coming, kept getting beat up. At one point, they, somebody spanked her so hard, Kortikoff narrates rather vividly, too vividly, that, that her, her legs looked like hamburger meat. That's, that, that's how hard they, they spanked her with their bare hands. Finally, during a third raid they made on this group, there she is again, Sergei Kortikoff sees her. One of his friends is about to fatally kill her. By the way, they were in the Naval Academy. And this is what they did as a side job. So, um, so that's, one of his friends was about to really uh, lay a major blow to this young woman, and Sergei Kortikov stopped him, and he said, don't touch her, there's something different about her. He was stunned by her just being there. It was this young girl's courage and faith and loyalty to God that caused Sergei Kortikov to begin to consider whether Christianity was true or not. He went through a long pilgrimage before he became a Christian. But when he finally came to Christ, he remembered it was that girl and her courage in Christ that launched him in the direction of believing in Christ. And he concludes his autobiography in gratitude to this brave Christian girl as I conclude this message. Here's what he says, And finally to Natasha, whom I beat terribly and was willing to be beaten a third time for her faith, I want to say, Natasha, largely because of you, my life has now changed, and I'm a fellow believer in Christ with you. I have a new life before me. 
God has forgiven me. I hope you can. Thank you, Natasha. Wherever you are, I will never, never forget you. She was a priest at the altar. And look at her witness. It's amazing. As I say, some have questioned this account. I, I think it has the ring of truth. So God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering to empower our proclamation to the world. I conclude. I wasn't going to conclude with that. My wife hates it when I say I conclude, and I'm going to give another conclusion. She said, look, I'm ready to go when you say the first conclusion. Here's the second conclusion. I'm glad she's not here. <laughs> the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood is fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation and therefore by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your presence will be with us. Increase your presence with us to protect us spiritually through whatever suffering you may bring us, small suffering or big suffering, to empower our witness to the world. We pray this would be for your honor.